Con class is very much in session. I see a few more of you in attendance this time around because obviously it's been the bloody Royal Rumble, everyone's favourite pay-per-view of the year. But how good was it? Let's find out as we take a look at the Royal Rumble graded. Just before we begin, actually, I think because some people like to check the comments before they actually watch a video, well, let's, let's play a nice little prank on all the people who've decided to look at the comments first. You could just say, like, in the comments, maybe something along the lines of, can't believe, like, choose your favourite slightly crap WCW gimmick. So, like, can't believe the Shockmaster came back, can't believe the Yate appeared in the Rumble, can't believe Oz, you know, that sort of thing. Do that, and then everyone will just think it was the craziest Rumble of all time. Um, that would be really nice. Just the little things that keep me going. I'm Jack from Colorholic.com, and this is the Royal Rumble 2019 Graded. So I suppose we better start by looking at the three pre-show matches, two advertised matches and one non-advertised bonus match. Uh, they won't really factor into the overall grade at the end, but let's just give them a grade anyway. So we started things off with, quite a strange one, a non-title match between the Raw Tag Team Champions Bobby Roode and Chad Gable and the team of Razor and Scott Dawson. Yeah, this was a bit of a weird one. Uh, the whole setup to this was backstage. Drake Maverick learned that uh, the Authors of Pain and The Revival could both win a title shot if the two healthy members of either team, Razor and Scott Dawson, could coexist and defeat Rude and Gable in non-title action. To me, I was like, brilliant, they're gonna win, and then we'll see two title matches at some point in Raw in the future. That's not what happened. Uh, Razor and Dawson just couldn't get along. Uh, despite both being heels, they were still sort of at each other's throats, a lot of blind tags, a lot of little miscommunications here and there. And it eventually led, obviously, to Bobby Roode and Chad Gable winning with their double team move. Um, the match wasn't bad at all, the, the booking was just curious, and on the pre-show it didn't really do much to get the crowd excited. So nothing majorly wrong with it, but very uninspiring stuff as well. I'm going to give it a C-. minus. Next up, the US title match between Rusev, the defending champion, with Lana of course, and Shinsuke Nakamura. Uh, this match was... well, it was certainly better than the first one. It was, um, it was a lot more back and forth than I thought it would be, and it also featured a surprise ending as well. I didn't think we'd see that title change hands on the pre-show. I thought we'd see maybe the Cruiserweight title change hands on the pre-show, but certainly not the US title. So after several sort of semi-convincing near falls and stuff, when we saw Nakamura sort of try and cheat, I think he tried to undo the turnbuckle, then Lana tried to stop him by pointing a shoe at him and then going, look at that, he's cheating. And the referee was like, yep. And then Rusev kind of got in the way, accidentally hit Lana, she fell off the apron and it would come into play later on in the night, her, her ankle injury, which was good to see. But for the time being in this match, found it a little bit curious and I don't agree with Rusev losing to Nakamura. Everyone was excited to see him as the US champion and the belt was doing Nakamura no favours. So to see Shinsuke back with the title again, I get that it might be to bring a potential babyface such as Mustafa Ali into the title picture. However, it wasn't the result I think we were all looking for. Again, still an alright match. I think I'm going to go for a B- minus because... It was a little bit more back and forth, a little bit more competitive than I thought it was. And even though I don't agree with the ending, it was genuinely surprising. And finally, the last match of the pre-show, the four-way Cruiserweight Championship match between Buddy Murphy, the defending champion, Akira Tozawa, Hideo Itami, and Kalisto as well. Uh, this is the match where I thought the title was going to change hands, uh, but ultimately, after a lot of fast-paced, classic 205 Live Cruiserweight-style action, we saw Buddy Murphy retain, but that doesn't mean that it was a flat finish with, you know, the, the, crew, the, the champion easily defeating all of his opponents. They structured this match really well. In amongst all the crazy spots and stuff, the one I'm thinking of especially is the one we've used for the image there. The one of Tozawa being monkey flipped off the apron, high into the air. Uh, around all of that, they structured a really nice story in which it was kind of boiling down to Atami and Buddy Murphy, with Atami being a little bit sneaky here and there, using some heelish tactics, letting his opponents wear themselves out and then trying to sneak in and get a pinfall as and when he could. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It was frantic, it was fun. Yes, it got overshadowed by a lot of the main card afterwards, but on the whole, you know what? It sounds like I might be grading this slightly too highly, but I can't think of anything wrong with this match. I'm gonna give it an A-. I thought it was, thought it was pretty damn impressive, actually. And Buddy Murphy continues to be a wonderful Cruiserweight champion. Now onto the first match of the main show proper, the SmackDown Women's title match between the champion Asuka and the challenger Becky Lynch. This was intense. Fittingly intense, I might add, for the opening of the main portion of the show. There was a lot of trash talk early on. Becky's trash talk in English, Asuka's trash talk in Japanese. So they probably couldn't understand what 
they were saying to each other, well, no, Asuka can understand English. Don't know if Becky knows much Japanese. Uh, maybe she does. Maybe Asuka was really trying to get in her head. There were some great moments in this match, some great moves, and everything in between the moves made sense as well. Great character work by both women too. The, the moves that stick out most in my mind were the super back exploder off the top for a very convincing near fall, and then Becky's look of shock when Asuka kicked out, and then she sort of composed herself and went, okay, all right. Uh, also the, um, I don't know really what it was, kind of a swinging neck breaker off the apron onto the, the mats outside, that was terrifying but really effective. Reminding me when Cody Rhodes did it to Ibushi in New Japan a year ago, that was pretty intense stuff too. Um, yeah, as I say, this was fittingly intense and the dueling submissions towards the end really got everyone invested too, with both women actually going for each other's finishes at, at certain points as well. Really, really enjoyed that as well. The only thing that sort of divided opinion for me and for pretty much everyone online that I saw react to it as well, was the finish because Asuka made Becky tap out the top babyface in WWE right now, submitting clean in the opening match of a pay-per-view. It was quite strange to see, but I can kind of forgive it because it was a modification of the Asuka lock that we've just not seen. Uh, and it took, it took Becky by surprise as much as it took us by surprise. So I can sort of forgive it. It didn't take away from the quality of the match, which from bell to bell was probably the strongest match of the entire night. This got us off to a really hot start. And I'm going to grade it an A. Yes, I was si like slightly annoyed that Becky tapped out clean, but I thought I'd reserve my judgment and see what happened later on in the night, whether either of these women would get involved in the women's rumble match. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, that's kind of what happened. So, yeah, I'm going to give this an A. Thought it was well done. And yeah, probably, pound for pound, the best match of the night. Next up, the SmackDown Tag Team Title match and the funniest match of the night, whether intentionally or not at certain points. Uh, the Bar, the defending champions, against the dream team of Shane McMahon and The Miz. And The Miz wore his custom Shane McMahon gear and, and his dad was at ringside cheering them on. And it was just wonderful. Obviously, it was stupid. Shane McMahon kicking the piss out of both SmackDown Tag Team Champions. Shane was the hot tag. He came in and he was giving it all that and like proper going for it. I've dropped my phone. Everything's going on. It was it was silly, but at the same time, it was fun. And you know, obviously, on these long pay-per-views that WWE put on the network these days, especially the big four pay-per-views, you need some more light-hearted stuff to break up the serious action, especially on a card as stacked and intense as this one. Shane took uh, quite a few nasty bumps in this match, as he does, that's very much Shane McMahon's thing, and actually finished things off with a shooting star press. And to be fair, no matter what you think of Shane as a wrestler, I, I mean, a man approaching 50, I believe, that's, that's an impressive feat of agility still. And, and it was a good one. It was a good shooting star press too. It wasn't like ricochet levels or anything, but it was like, Billy Kidman sort of level. It might have even put Billy Kidman's to shame. Can't believe Billy Kidman returned for the Rumble. Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know what to grade this because I don't agree with Shane McMahon holding the tag team titles, but it is the more interesting result for now. I feel bad for Sheamus and Cesaro. They lost to a child at last year's WrestleMania. They're losing to Shane McMahon at the Royal Rumble this year, but it was just kind of hilarious seeing the Miz and Shane celebrate with Miz's dad at ringside. I found it hard to dislike this. I can't grade it too highly because it was fairly ludicrous. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna give it a B. I think on balance, a B is probably fair. The action was pretty fast and intense and exciting. The Shane stuff was silly, but it was fun. And wrestling should be fun. Yeah, we break it down and we analyze it. And we get upset about it and it, we take it far, far too seriously, but it should be fun. And this was fun. Next up, another very intense title match in the similar vein to Becky Lynch versus Asuka from just before. Sasha Banks versus Ronda Rousey for Ronda's Raw Women's Championship. This was intense in a bit of a different way from Becky and Asuka. Becky and Asuka was a bit more raw and rough and ready. Whereas this was intense in an intensely competitive sort of way. Uh, again, there was trash talk and that sort of thing, but it was more about two women trying to prove that they were better than each other rather than trying to kind of do damage to one another as we saw in the first match. This was a little bit more technical and a little bit more amateur style. Um, Sasha had redone her homework on Ronda. There were a lot of cool counters by Sasha. And honestly, I was well impressed with Sasha's performance here. This is the most I've enjoyed Sasha Banks in a long time. That's mainly not her fault. That's more about the way she's been booked recently. Banks, of course, tapped outside the ring at one point when Ronda got the armbar on, but it didn't really harm her too much. And she worked her way back into the match. And I really enjoyed the bit where she undid a bit of her attire, like the arm strap or something, used it to assist the bank statement towards the end of the match. And the referee was obviously like, no, you, you've only got a count of five, but it, it really showed Sasha's 
shades of grey in her character. She's, she's getting a little bit heelish now and then, isn't she? As she was throughout the build-up to this match. Ultimately, though, Ronda picked up the victory. Not a submission victory, a pinfall victory with that big, twisting Samoan drop thing she does. And it, I thought Sasha was legitimately hurt at first. She slammed her down very hard. The ref was straight in there to check on Sasha. And then Ronda reached out the arm, obviously, and grabbed Sasha as if to say, are you all right? And I thought, ooh, she probably doesn't think the camera's on her there. But then we realized, of course, that it all played into the aftermath of the match. So afterwards, we had all of like the respect stuff with Sasha and Ronda going, you know what, you did great and all this sort of thing. Sasha did a really good job of looking devastated that she hadn't won, but kind of begrudgingly like, yeah, okay, fair enough. And then when we thought it was all over, Sasha came back down. Ronda went again, oh, you did really well. Don't be too upset. And Sasha went, four horsewomen, look at that. And strode to the back. Awesome stuff. It actually impacts my grade as well. I was torn between a B plus and an A minus for this match. And because of how great the character work was, not just throughout the match, but especially in the aftermath as well, I'm going to give it an A minus. Um, really enjoyed it. Again, Ronda proves that she's developed so quickly. She can just have excellent pay-per-view level matches with the right opponent. And Sasha was definitely that right sort of opponent. Now on to the first of the two Royal Rumbles of the night, the Women's Royal Rumble, which is a tricky match to grade um, because the first half really wasn't good. It was pretty weak, definitely weaker than last year's Women's Royal Rumble. The last year's Women's Royal Rumble actually put the first half of this match to shame, really. There were people making sloppy mistakes quite a lot. There was a lot of comedy that just didn't click, didn't really work at all. But then things really picked up and really escalated towards the end. And we ended up with one of like, in my opinion, one of the best finishes to a Rumble match that I've ever seen. So. It's a tricky one to grade. Basically what I'm gonna do is just go through my notes and say whether I liked certain things or not. So we started off with Lacey Evans, which I thought was good. Then she started kind of messing up. Maybe the pressure got to her a little bit. She was meant to be doing nip ups and stuff, but she kept slipping and falling. Uh, uh, Natalia got a quick elimination on Liv Morgan. I quite liked that. That was quite cool to see, especially with Liv returning as part of the Riot Squad as a whole later on to assist Ruby. Um, Billy Kay waiting for Peyton Royce, decent. A lot of people point out on Twitter, actually, that this Rumble was particularly lax in terms of the rules, which I'll agree it was. It sacrificed logic a lot for comedy, but if anyone can pull off comedy, it's the Iconics. Um, yeah. I've written here, Tamina's a racist. She's not. Jia Lee basically came out, and on commentary, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Corey Graves, said, oh, or someone said, you know, Jia Lee's the first ever Chinese person to be a WWE superstar, to compete in a WWE ring. And then Corey Graves, I think, went, well, if Tamina's got anything to do about it, then she'll also be the last. And I thought, are you, imply are you implying that Tamina wants to ensure that no other Chinese people are the WWE superstars? Because Tamina apparently doesn't like the Chinese very much. I'm, I'm putting words in Tamina's mouth there. No, in fact, it wasn't. It was the commentary's fault. We had Ember Moon doing the Kofi Kingston toes under the rope thing to avoid elimination. I like that. Everyone ganging up on Charlotte Flair when she came in. I like that. Kyrie Sane, it was great to see her. Then, 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 right then, then we got Maria Kanellis. And I, I used to love Maria back in the day. But what, what was she doing in this rumble? So the whole thing with Alicia Fox, the whole makeshift heel alliance, I was like, I'm on board with this. Let's see where this goes. They teamed up a bit, worked quite effectively. And then Alicia sort of let Maria try on her hat. And we were like, oh, they're friends. That's cool. And then for no, re for no reason, Maria took off the hat, stamped on it a bit. And Alicia Fox, rather than attack Maria because they're wrestlers and they fight for a living, I threw a tantrum in the middle of the ring. Around this sort of time as well, we had, uh, oh, we had Naomi coming out and immediately eliminating Mandy Rose. Cool, plays into the feud from SmackDown, I like it. And then did that really cool escape where Mandy tried to like smash her into the barricade, but she, or tried to like powerbomb her on the floor or something, I think. Naomi obviously managed to roll up onto the crowd barrier, it was insane, and then jump to the ring steps like John Morrison did back in the day. That was really cool. And I especially liked how Mandy then immediately eliminated her for heel heat. Really good stuff. I haven't been a big fan of their feud, but this is the best part of it so far for me. Casey Catanzaro from NXT, it was nice to see her. Uh, she did another sort of nimble Kofi Kingston style escape. Um, was it as good as Naomi's on oh, balance? Probably not, but it was still all right. She landed on like her back like a turtle and then sort of shimmied her way to the crowd barrier and then, and then like handstand walked, hand walked, and then wrapped around the corner. It was inventive, you know, it was inventive. And I think she's probably one of the only women flexible enough to do that in the Rumble. So that was, that was cool to see. But yeah, she did make a few little mistakes here and there, but it was nice to see her get a shot. There, mm, 
Then we had Zelina Vega, who came out dressed as Vega from Street Fighter. That was great, loved that. I couldn't wait for Kenny Omega to come out dressed as Ken in the Men's Rumble. Um, then she hit into the ring a little bit later on and kept being like, oh, let's see what's going on. Nope, I'm still under the ring. And then Hornswoggle was under there. One of my least favorite episodes of Raw ever is when a main part of the show was DX going under the ring to find out that Hornswoggle lived there and to go to Little People's Court and that sort of thing. It was so, so stupid. It was a dark time for Monday Night Raw. And they've sort of called back to that with Hornswoggle continuing to live under the ring, chasing Zelina Vega to the back, I guess because she's an attractive woman and he wants to like kiss her. I hope it's only that. It was, this was, this was a bad part of the rumble. This was one of the comedy spots that just didn't work for me. But things then slowly started to get a little bit better. The sloppiness started to get eliminated. Uh, Lacey Evans got eliminated. Um, and yeah, it was it was pretty cool to see things like, uh, well, Io Shirai was a good entrant. Rhea Ripley, it was cool to see her as well. Uh, Alexa Bliss got a huge pop when she came out. It was good to see Bailey getting a few eliminations. Hopefully she can pick up a bit of momentum heading towards Elimination Chamber, where she's gonna turn on Sasha and feud with her at WrestleMania, I think. And then, and then, this is where it got real. This is where it really started to go down. Lana made her entrance, obviously, hobbling along on her ankle very slowly, and Nia Jax made her entrance and just beat her up a little bit and worked that injured leg and Becky Lynch took full advantage coming out. Having a word with Finley, it was great to see her talk to Finley, and he was like, go for it, okay? Go for it, do what you've got to do. And everyone came unglued, one of the loudest parts of the entire night. And from then on, I thought the ending was absolutely excellent. I thought it was great how when Nia was eliminated, she attacked Becky Lynch, injured her knee, and everyone was in a little bit of doubt as to what was gonna happen, and then Charlotte, Fully healing it up, loved that. Loved it when Becky got in and Charlotte just went for the leg mercilessly, wanting that Rumble victory. And then Becky was able to turn it around and pick up the win. And I'm sure you've seen the viral footage now of that Irish pub going absolutely crazy for Becky Lynch. I was also going crazy for Becky Lynch. I, I liked it before, it was cool. Um, and yeah, the right woman won. The right woman won. Charlotte's got a claim to say that she should have won because Becky was never a proper entrant. So it does lead nicely if they want to do that triple threat at WrestleMania as well. This is so hard to grade. It's so hard to grade because it was weak in points, pretty terrible in points, excellent in points as well. I think the ending's more important and I think the booking was absolutely spot on with Becky Lynch picking up the victory. I thought various people actually performed pretty well. I enjoyed Ember Moon, for example. Io Shirai looked great. Nice to see Rhea Ripley and all that sort of thing. So, this may sound to some people like I'm overrating it, but I'm gonna give it an A minus because wrestling is sometimes about big, big moments. And that Becky Lynch victory is a big, memorable moment. And they booked it to a T. Perfect booking. I think it forgives a lot of the mistakes from the earlier portion of the match as well. And I think, I think I'm all right giving this an A minus. Just about. And then next up we have the WWE Championship match, Styles and Bryan. I, I don't want to dwell too long on this because they were in a very unfortunate spot. The crowd were so burnt out from Becky Lynch's victory that they were silent for the majority of this match. And Styles and Bryan tried their very hardest to get them invested. And they were wrestling a really good match. It's, it's Styles and Daniel Bryan. They're never going to have a less than great match. But the crowd reaction or lack thereof really did affect it, I'm sad to say. Another thing that affected it was the finish as well, with Eric Rowan coming down, dressed suspiciously like Daniel Bryan, getting involved after, the, after a ref bump, and choke slamming AJ Styles and allowing Bryan to pick up the dubious victory. Those two things for me, the lack of crowd reaction and the Eric Rowan stuff, which I'll reserve a little bit of judgment on until we see how it plays out, but those two things sort of cheapen this match for me quite a lot, despite it technically being a really good match. I can only give it a B, unfortunately, and it just goes to show how important crowd reaction can be. Next up, Finn Balor and Brock Lesnar. Oh, mmm, good, good stuff. Apart from the finish, which I found a little bit abrupt. I'll explain why I think. So, I really enjoyed Balor jumping Lesnar before the bell. That was really cool to see Finn Balor bring in a lot of intensity as he has in the past week or so on Monday Night Raw. Uh, I liked his three topes, they were insane. Lesnar was awesome with his selling, really selling the midriff after being rammed into the corner, the pointy bit of the announce table. 
And of course, suplexing Finn around when he was on top too. It was cool to see, and Heyman, of course, was being wonderful on the outside. The only problem for me was the finish. It was executed really well with Balor hitting the coup de grace, and then Brock Lesnar snapping him like into a Kimura as he kicked out on two. Uh, and then, obviously, Finn Balor just had to tap out, otherwise the implication was his arm was going to be broken. Um, I'm not sure if this was the best finish. It was a cool match, it was unique, and after the kind of draining Brian AJ match, it was nice to see a, a fast and explosive one straight after. But it makes me question why they built Finn up so strong just to, just to have him tap out quite, quite abruptly, quite jarringly. At the end of the match. With that said, I'm going to give it a B plus because I don't want to take away from the intensity that both men, that both men, excuse me, brought throughout the rest of the bout. It was just that finish for me didn't quite do it. I feel like Balor may have deserved a little bit more. I thought, for example, at various stages like Lesnar was going to take the DQ or deliberately get himself counted out or something like that just to help protect Finn a little bit more heading into WrestleMania. That is the only change I think I would have made. Just protect Finn a little bit more in the finish. And finally, the men's Royal Rumble. So in wild contrast to the women's Royal Rumble, which was massively inconsistent, really weak in parts, insanely strong in parts, the men's Rumble didn't quite hit the heights of the women's Rumble, but it didn't hit the lows either. A far more consistent match, but was it better or worse on the whole? Again, it's a very tricky one to grade. So once again, I'll just go through what happened and then just say what I thought was good or bad. Uh, I'll try and be as speedy as I can, because I know you've got another lesson to go to after this. <laughs> it's like we're in a classroom, it's great at school. So Elias was number one, good choice for number one because he's a great promo guy. Jarrett was number, Jeff Jarrett was number two. I didn't mind it, you know, I didn't mind it. Don't quite get why Elias was a bit of a dick, a bit of a heel to him, despite Elias being a babyface these days. That was a little bit strange, but you know what? It was entertaining and it was nice to see a surprise return at number two. Normally they're like sort of buried in there, but to see a surprise return at number two, that was quite unique and different. And honestly, I, I just didn't really mind it. Maybe would have been improved if Honky Tonk Man had also come out and they'd done a little, a little song all together. It was great to see Angle. It was great to see Johnny Gargano. It was great to see uh, Alistair Black a bit later on as well. And Pete Dunne, of course. It's coming home for England. Uh, yeah, the surprise entrance in this match, all the call-ups from NXT, were a lot stronger, I feel, than in the women's match. Kerr Hawkins did the hiding thing. Thankfully, Hornswoggle didn't pop out this time. But Tyus O'Neill chased him under the ring. A great callback to the Greatest Rumble. I think the comedy in this match worked better than the comedy in the women's match, too. That was another advantage that the men's rumble had over the women's one. But again, it didn't quite hit the molten hot heights of the end of the women's match. Great to see Mustafa Ali have a strong performance as well, eliminating Shinsuke Nakamura at one point. Kofi, right? Kofi had two of his like crazy inventive escapes, but I don't think either of them really worked as well as some of the other ones in the past. It was always going to be the issue with Kofi. He always has to try and top what he's done before. And it's just getting harder and harder too because he's done quite a lot of the stuff that he could possibly do. Uh, in both instances, he nearly hit the floor with both feet. I think he managed to avoid it both times, but it was looking a bit hairy at points and a little bit clumsy and a bit ragged. So I love Kofi, but I think maybe his best days in terms of rumble escapes are starting to get behind him. No way, Jose, no idea what he was doing there. At least he provided a cool entrance for Drew McIntyre, just wading through No Way Jose's conga line. Uh, oh yeah, oh man, Alistair Black eliminating Dean Ambrose. That was really cool. Uh, it was also cool to see Mustafa Ali eliminate Samoa Joe. Uh, I thought after he eliminated Nakamura that he'd be thrust into the US title picture with Nakamura the new US champion. But eliminating Joe makes me think that that feud probably isn't quite over yet. Uh, Baron Corbin eliminating Alistair Black. You know, I didn't mind it too much because Black had just done that cool thing where Pete Dunne had broken his finger and he popped it back in. Ugh. And then Corbin sort of blindsided him. So that, that worked for me, to be fair. Bobby Lashley. I enjoyed his role in this match. I thought he'd eliminated himself by accident, to be honest, when Rollins kind of kicked him out and he slipped off the ropes and he went, oh no, but it was all part of the plan. He was meant to then damage Rollins, so we sort of forgot about him towards the end and it made him a bit more of an underdog as we approached the final few moments of the match. He slammed him through the announce table, great bump. I wasn't too hot on seeing Lashley last a long time in this match. I thought he would as IC champion, but I thought this was a better use of him. I thought this match on the whole was booked a lot more sensibly than the women's one, but again, I thought the women's one at the end was booked absolutely superbly. So it's, again, it's hard to, it's hard to decide between the two. Uh, what was next? Oh, Dolph Ziggler came in at some time around this point and it was just strange to see Dolph Ziggler feature so heavily in the end game of a Royal Rumble match. Almas and Rey Mysterio had a great performance each. 
and continued their little feud as well after some excellent matches on SmackDown. And we had the insane Tower of Doom spot that I almost forgot about with Strowman, who came in to replace Cena, just proving what an absolute beast he is once again. He is a freakishly, freakishly strong man. Then something that divides opinion, but I, I actually thought it was done quite well, Nia Jax jumping our truth before his number 30 entrance and just inserting herself in the Rumble, copying Becky Lynch from earlier in a way. Uh, it, was, it was in fitting with Nia Jax's character, you know, she's entitled, she believes she can do whatever she wants, she can break the rules, she can enter the Men's Royal Rumble even though she's a woman. And yes, we've seen women enter in the past, but that was when, you know, there was no Women's Royal Rumble, so that was officially allowed back then, I suppose. Whereas in this instance, it was Nia kind of breaking the rules a little bit, and then she eliminated Mustafa Ali. You could argue that Ali deserved maybe, I guess, to be eliminated by someone on SmackDown who he could then have a bit of a feud with, but he got some big eliminations, so I don't begrudge him being eliminated by Nia. She is, I think, bigger than him anyway, so it's not too unbelievable. Um, and I thought that she held her own. She lasted a lot longer than women usually do in the Royal Rumble, in the Men's Royal Rumble anyway, and didn't look out of place. It was cool to see the men trio with respect and all hit their finishes on her, but yeah, it was a nice little quirk. I thought it was decent, and it opens the door to a future of potentially, like, not in the near future, but somewhere down the line, of more intergender wrestling getting involved. I know that that's a tricky topic and some people go, oh, intergender wrestling is stupid or whatever. I personally don't see a problem with it. Maybe it's because I'm an indie wrestling fan and it's far more common on the indies, especially in the UK, but whatever. I thought it was decent and I'm not even a big Nia Jax fan. And then the final two that it all boiled down to once Ziggler had been eliminated very late in the Rumble. Ziggler again, playing a key role in the last stages of a Rumble. What's he got on Vince? Don't understand. But the final two with Strowman and an exhausted and battered Rollins was really cool. When it got down to those two, I thought, well, Rollins must be winning them because they wouldn't go for Strowman Lesnar again at WrestleMania. Surely Rollins Lesnar is the fresh matchup everyone wants to see. But the moves they did cast enough doubt, I think, in everyone's mind. There was point, points where, I think one point Rollins charged across the ring. Strowman would look like he was gonna backdrop him out and everyone went, oh, no, 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 no. That was cool. They both ended up on the apron. It was nice to see Rollins get the win with the curb stomp, sending Strowman to the outside. Yeah, good stuff, good finish. Was it just me or did the crowd seem a little bit muted, a little bit deflated at the end there? They weren't as hot on this finish as they were for Becky Lynch earlier on in the night and the match did suffer slightly at the end because of that. But in terms of choosing a winner, I thought Rollins was excellent. I'm a big Rollins fan, and I can't wait to see what happens at WrestleMania. On the whole, this men's Royal Rumble match gets an A- minus as well. Yes, it was more consistent and stronger throughout than the women's Rumble, but the ending felt a little bit flat in comparison to the Becky Lynch stuff from earlier. Uh, yeah, as I've said, the women's Royal Rumble was like this, and the men's Royal Rumble was a bit of a smooth gradient, you know? Let's crack on with the overall grade. Overall, I will give this Royal Rumble an A- minus as well. Online, the response was a lot more divided than I thought it would be. A lot of people going, oh, it was too long. Yeah, well, it was, to be fair, it was a really long show, but people going like, it was long and boring and stuff. I wasn't bored, really, at any point, apart from bizarrely, Stars versus Brian, and that wasn't because of the work of the two guys, who are two of the best ever. It was because the crowd weren't invested and it really did have an effect on the match. But on the whole, the card was obviously dominated by the two Rumble matches, and they both got A-minuses. And I think also Becky and Asuka was what excellent, that got an A. So generally, it'll all sort of average out if you take into account the length of the two Rumbles to a big A-minus overall. Royal Rumble 2019 gets an A minus. So that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching the 2019 Royal Rumble. Do make sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below once you've said, can't believe the Yeti came back for the Royal Rumble. Obviously, obviously. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. Thank you for watching. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you want to, at Jack the Jobber. You can find all of us at Cultaholic. Check out our Patreon as well if you want to, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And remember, of course, if you haven't done so already, to hit subscribe and to join us.